Seeing how it's Youth Sunday, I, I got volunteered to preach this morning. This one was on the schedule, uh, so uh, don't get worried. This one was actually scheduled for me to be up here. Uh, and um, as I thought about what I could teach about, initially I was like, well, should I build something from scratch or should I grab something? And then I was like, well, with Day of Love and all the stuff going on, it's like, I might just pull into the archives again and then just retool a sermon that I had from a year ago that came from a series called A Faith That Works. And uh, this was a series on the book of James. The book of James is one of my favorite books of the Bible. It is so practical. Uh, A lot of things that it says in there kind of hits you right between the eyes. But as clear as it is, the content is, is pretty heavy and it's hard to live out sometimes. And some examples are in James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, the verses say, My brothers and sisters, consider it nothing but joy when you fall into all sorts of trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Those verses and others like it, we read and we think, man, I wish that one wasn't in the Bible, God. Because joy and trials in my life Those things seem to be at opposition. When I'm in the middle of a trial, I'm not thinking, yay me, this is great. But rather, the the idea is, is if we can find joys even in the trials of this life, our eyes would be fixed on Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, in such a way that it doesn't matter what our circumstances are. It just, it's, my God is better. I find my strength in the joy of the Lord and nothing else. Um, like I said, you know, joy and, and, and trials, they seem to be at opposition, and I, I don't always face my trials with joy in my heart. Another example you see is in chapter 1 as well in verses 19 and 20, and it says, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, let every person be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. These verses disarmed me in one of the biggest trials I've ever had in my life. God's righteousness is not accomplished by human anger. You know what? On second thought, maybe James isn't one of my favorite books of the Bible. No, it really, it really is. And like I said, the reason why is because you can't, you can't, you can't sit, there's no gray. It's, it's right there. It's right there in front of your face. And, and if you're like me, you need a mallet or you need to run into that wall. You need to see, it's like, no, God's truth says this. This is exactly what it's saying. And then, of course, James uses illustrations like the tongue being like a, a forest fire or, or a deadly poison or her or when he talks about the man who looks at himself in a mirror and walks out the door and forgets what he looks like. Or can fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? The book of James. If you haven't read it, I challenge you to read it. It's a really short book, uh, but there's so much pound, packed in there. But those things are for a different sermon and a different morning. This morning, uh, we will be looking at James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. This passage deals with wisdom and understanding, specifically two types of wisdom, true wisdom that comes from God, and earthly wisdom that comes from the world. This morning in the verses, we will define both types of wisdom and how one leads to life and the other leads to death. So just for fun, I've got a nice illustration that makes me look really good and Pastor Clint not look so good, um, to show you what earthly wisdom looks like. Here it goes. Since we are talking about wisdom this morning, it is fitting that the wisest pastor be preaching this morning. Okay, now now don't laugh too hard. Um, This works well because it lacks humility and it leads to envy and promotes selfish ambition and selfishness. See, pastors struggle with these things too. While I wish it wasn't true that that maybe we get a pass but it's not true. We, we struggle with these things as, as well. And, and I love to use myself as an example uh, to, of the wrong thing or what to do. A better statement would be, it's a good thing we're teaching on wisdom because I have all of the answers on what not to do. 
you know, or how not to be wise. Uh, but all that to say, let's go ahead. I didn't do this last time, and I, and I kicked myself. I, I love how Pastor Clint says when we read our, our main passage, let's go ahead and stand. Uh, and so let's stand. If you haven't already turned to James 3, chap- chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, go ahead and get there. And I'm going to read it from the NET, the NET Bible. And here we go, James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, he should show his works done in, great, in gentleness or humbleness that wisdom brings. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfishness in your hearts, do not boast and tell lies against the truth. Such wisdom does not come from above, but is earthly, natural, or demonic. For where there is jealousy and selfishness, there is disorder in every evil practice. But wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, accommodating, full of mercy and good fruit. It is impartial, not hypocritical. And the fruit that consists of righteousness is planted in peace among those who make peace. Dear Heavenly Father, let your words be many and my words be few this morning. I ask your spirit to be working in the hearts of your people and to open the eyes of those who are not yet yours. We seek your wisdom this morning and long to live lives that reflect your truth and not our own. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated. So verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, he should show his works done in gentleness that wisdom brings. Who is wise among you? James begins this section with a rhetorical question that gets his readers thinking. Earlier in verse 1 of this chapter, James says that not many of you should become teachers. The answer to why many should not become teachers is not that people cannot teach, but rather not all people teach godly wisdom. You see, it's not that you're not all teachers. Believe it or not, everybody in this room is a teacher. You teach people your life. Aspiring to be a teacher, well, you better make sure you're teaching godly wisdom. And so this is why James says, don't aspire to be a teacher if you're not going to teach the truth. Because the other thing that's fun and not so fun, when you stand up here and you preach and teach the Word of God... My standard that God holds holds me to is a lot higher, and that's a good thing, lest I stumble and fall and teach a message that it's not the gospel. We have so many examples of wisdom and understanding that is not rooted in gentleness and humility, rather wisdom that is used to justify the very opposite. But let's not get ahead of ourselves as we are going to discuss earthly wisdom in a few seconds or minutes. I cannot help but see the correlation between faith and wisdom here that James makes. In James chapter 2, verses 14, it says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Here we see that if someone is wise, in, in verse 13, it says, By his good conduct... He should show his works done in gentleness that wisdom brings. So James, in dealing with with faith and wisdom, says to his readers, show me. Don't just tell me you have faith. Show me your faith through your deeds. And if you think you're wise, then show me you're wise by living out the principles that God has put in front of you. Verse 13 says that a person who is wise and understanding will have good conduct. Good conduct. How do you carry yourself during the day? What is your life teaching people? As I said earlier, your life is teaching something. Is it teaching godly wisdom? The line, do as I say and not as I do, has no ground in the Christian's life. We don't, get to, we don't get to say we know the right thing to do, but we're going to go ahead and do what we know is wrong. That goes back to that, the, the, the illustration that James makes. It's just like the man that goes and looks at himself in the mirror and then immediately forgets what he looks like. 
We have to live out this wisdom. We have to live out our faith. A good life is what we should aspire to, but not because it saves us, rather because it is a way we can show our love of God and obedience to him while pointing others to Christ. You see, this morning, we don't do good works because that's what saved us. As a follower of Christ, I know the one thing that saved me was Christ's death and resurrection. And that's it. But it saved me from all of the evil that I would, did, and will do. I was talking to, uh, to one of the teens, and, and, uh, and I just said, you, you do realize as a believer, we now choose to sin. A non-believer has no choice. They have to sin. That's why I'm surprised sometimes when the church looks at the world and they see the world sinning and they're shocked and appalled at the fact that they're doing exactly what they're supposed to do. What should shock us is those that claim Christ who are living in the world. Why am I different? Well, not because of anything that I've done, only because of what Christ has done for me and is still doing for me. This allows me to carry myself in the strength of the Lord. JBF, how is your conduct? Show me your good works. Not only do we see wisdom in our good conduct, but also in our good works. Wisdom is not something that sits idle, rather like faith, that is alive and moving, it is also alive and moving in our lives. The wisdom that James talks about here is not just building up one's intellect. Just like the verse we read about faith in 2.14, what good is wisdom without works or deeds? If someone tells you one thing but does another in their life, that person is a hypocrite. No, brothers and sisters, wisdom is meant to be lived out once it is learned. If we only come to church, Bible studies, to learn more about God, yet do nothing with the information but store it up, we deceive ourselves. If we think we are wise, James again says, show me your good conduct, show me your good works, done in the gentleness that wisdom brings. Moving on to verse 14, James tells us the things that have no part of godly wisdom. Verse 14, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfishness in your hearts, do not boast and tell lies against the truth. Something that I have had to consider not too long ago and to my shame should have been aware of the whole time is when all the political opinions and talks and even medical advice from the past two years, social justice talks, all of this stuff about gender equality, all of these things that are going on in our world, and all of a sudden, you know what? I want to put my two cents in. All while I should step back and think, what are my two cents worth? Does it find its root in the wisdom of God or of this world? Does what I have to say spread peace? Too often I would be so outraged by what I was reading, I had to get my words in and gentleness and humility were nowhere to be found in my response. Righteous anger is a thing, and Jesus did it well. But too often, righteousness and anger in my life are at opposition to one another. All this to say that we need to make sure that we are not boasting in the Lord, claiming wisdom when we live out James 3.9. With it, the tongue that is, we bless the Lord the Father, and with it we curse the people made in his image. You know, we don't know exactly what James is referring to here, but what we do know is that we still struggle with it today. Bitter jealousy and selfish ambition are things we, that can creep into our conversations and we can get deceived to think that we are wise, but we are telling lies against the truth. So when I come across a comment on social media, hear something that I don't agree with, I try to practice James 1.19 
Let every person be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. If I feel the need to respond, I take myself through a few questions. What is my relationship with this person? Does my response to them end at words? You think about that? When I respond, does that just end my response? Is it just those words? Who am I helping in my response? When it comes to social media, I only respond through personal message, especially if it's something important, to try to limit confusion. Because church, I've been there too. It's just like, oh, I want to see how many people like what I posted. I want to see how many people agree. Yeah, amen. Let's go ahead and shove their nose in the dirt some more. I know my response is rooted in selfishness more than my wanting to help. Far too often, I don't make it through my questions. A lot of times, I'll type out my response and then delete it. But that's also dangerous because how many times have you accidentally hit return instead of delete, and there it goes. Then you're in a panic trying to delete it. Like, oh, here we go. I knew and I was trying to do the right thing. Does that count? <laughs> See, the subject matter doesn't matter. We are, not just, we are not somehow justified to tear someone down just because we know we are right or we feel God is on our side. Church, the crusade should be such a reminder of how wrong we can be. I think of a movie line, God wills it, <laughs> as if somehow that's going to make everything better. It's like, oh, nope, I, I think this is God. Well, right here in James, it says that true wisdom, gentleness, peaceable. Where are those things when we're in our heated debates? The word also tells us not to get involved in meaningless quarrels. Moving on in our passage, James identifies earthly wisdom and its fruit in verse 15. We need to understand that our lives are teaching something, whether we are aware or not. We are also all bearing fruit, but is the fruit rotten to its core, or is it the fruit of the Spirit, and is it bringing life? Such wisdom does not come from above, but is earthly. In verse 15, it says, it's natural. Natural is basically just saying it's unspiritual, it's demonic. For where there is jealousy and selfishness, there is disorder in every evil practice. Wisdom shows good conduct, good works, and is gentle and humble, and it comes from God, but wisdom of the world is full of envy, jealousy, selfish ambition, and leads to disorder of all kinds of evil. Earthly wisdom comes from this life, and it seeks to preserve only that, this life. It is on full display every night on the news and in the lives of those around us trying to make a name for themselves. When we base our lives on earthly wisdom, we focus only on the physical. James says that the, the wisdom is natural or unspiritual. Many people have tried to find meaning in life only to come to the end and still be found wanting. Here it goes. Well, <clears throat> I got some lemonade here and some chocolate milk. And uh, originally, this illustration goes a little bit different, but I'm going to give it a go here. This is going to represent godly wisdom, and this is going to represent earthly wisdom. You're tracking with me? Godly wisdom, earthly wisdom. Well, you know what? I like some lemonade, but... Oh, that's tart. Oh. It's wonderful. But you know what? Today I'm feeling a little bit like I want to do what I want to do. <laughs> wow. 
You know, this serves multiple purposes. <clears throat> because who in their right mind would drink lemonade and chocolate milk at the same time? This guy, to make a point. <clears throat> the point is, is, is simple. <laughs> we keep trying to blend the two. And I'm sorry to myself and to you. <laughs> but you got to know, when you blend your earthly wisdom and good grief, I hope I don't spill this all over the place. I tend to have a, a, a shaking problem. I mean, look, look at that lemonade. Doesn't that look great? And because I never go halfway. <laughs> bottoms up. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you. I need a second there. You know what? I'm going to drink this last bit of water. <laughs> look at that. Look at that. Look at, look at what we do. As, as followers of Christ, we have the keys that unlock eternity. We have the truth of the gospel, the good news. But how easy are we so drawn to this? I wish that it was this, but it's not. Chocolate milk's good. You see, the things of this earth, they, they, they were meant to be good. Church, this morning, I'm, I'm not telling you that, you know what, <laughs> only read your Bibles, don't, don't, don't watch the news, don't do anything else, just shut everything else out. No, because Scripture says we are in the world, but we are not of the world. And God's got to be just shaking his head because all the while we're drinking this concoction of garbage when he sent his son to wipe all that out. You see, wisdom, true wisdom, sets us on the course to peace. And what it does is it frees us up to live in true freedom. I don't have to be slave to this anymore. Don't, don't miss it this morning. If you claim Christ, when you sin, you choose to sin. That's your choice. But thank God for the cross. Okay, don't get hit with the guilt and shame bomb here, but just remember, we have a choice. And honestly, we are all hypocrites. It's okay. Anybody that gives you the line, I don't go to church because they're full of, a, of hypocrites, I heard somebody say, well, there's room for one more, so why don't you come join us? Okay? We don't have to live the perfect life. Jesus did that for us. It doesn't free you up to go out and sin. Paul said, should we sin more so grace can abound? Absolutely not. But when we do fall, who do we go to? Go right to God. A few weeks ago, I said, when you lay down your worship at God, give him the box full of your garbage as well as the box that's full of all of your good deeds. Lay those things down before God because guess what my God does? He took my life and he took one of the worst things that I felt like I could do and he gave me an ability to speak into teenagers' lives because I struggled with sexuality when I was younger. And what the enemy tried to use in my life to destroy me, now I can use it to destroy the enemy in the lives of teens. That's that passage. What the enemy meant for evil, God can redeem. He can redeem. Getting back on track here. Proverbs 9, 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
We also see that the message of the cross is foolishness to this world. The way of the world is to fill ourselves with wisdom so that we can better ourselves. Education, while important, is a means to an end if it fails to consider godly wisdom. Simply put, earthly wisdom is a departure from the fear of the Lord. Psalm 14.1 says, Fools say to themselves, there is no God. They sin and commit evil deeds. None of them does what is right. As people all around us search for the answer to the question, who am I? We as believers know that the only way to truly know oneself is to first know God. Earthly wisdom is not only completely void of God, but it is actively in opposition to him. To try and answer a spiritual question without the Spirit is impossible. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The unbeliever does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. As smart as some people become on this planet, it is sad to see that they have spent their lives trying to disprove God instead of bending the knee to him. Earthly wisdom is earthly, unspiritual, and finally, it is demonic. It is evil because the root of the earthly wisdom is to lie against God, to reject him in the name of education, in the name of intellect, in the name of desires. As we look around and see the wisdom of this world claimed as truth while God's word is mocked, we shouldn't be surprised. God has told us in his word that the message of the cross is foolishness to this world. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 19, for the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will thwart the cleverness of the intelligent. The wisdom of this world is evil and it is in opposition to God. We need to be careful as followers that we do not try to blend the wisdom of this world with God's wisdom. Oh, are you sure? Do, do you guys need another example? <laughs> Maybe later. I, I might get away with it, though. I'll have to give it a good shake. It's starting to separate. <clears throat> <laughs> The wisdom of this world is evil and is in opposition to God. We need to be careful as his followers not to try to blend it, but rather live by the wisdom of God. Just as James warns about the tongue and being set on fire by hell, earthly wisdom is also going to burn. Verse 16 says, For where there is jealousy and selfishness, there is disorder in every evil practice. So the fruit of wisdom of this world is disorder and every evil practice. Jealousy and selfish ambition have no place in the hearts of God's people. Since we have already spent a lot of time talking about the wisdom of this world, verse 16 speaks for itself. Moving on to 17 and 18, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, it is gentle, it is accommodating, full of mercy, and good fruit. It is impartial and not hypocritical. And the fruit that consists of righteousness is planted in peace among those who make peace. James now defines what the wisdom of God is. Wisdom from God above is first pure, which we would expect since it is from God. It is without flaw. Wisdom that comes from God is not envious or selfish. Rather, it seeks to honor God and point others to him. Next, we see that wisdom from God is peaceable or peace-loving. The idea here is that while God's wisdom is in opposition to the wisdom of the world, it does not seek meaningless quarrels. Earlier when I mentioned my response to those on social media or that I disagree with, am I seeking peace or am I seeking to get into a fight? Is my wanting to be right more important than spreading the wisdom of God. 
In Romans chapter 12, verse 18, Paul tells us, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all people. Politics are a great example of why peaceable is so important. If we are so sure that the other party is wrong, we will never be able to come to the table and have a conversation because we are too busy focusing on all the things we don't like about the other party. If my mind was made up before I even entered a conversation, am I seeking to find peace rather on how I convince the other, can convince the other person that they're wrong? This is not wisdom from above. It is the wisdom of this world. Think I'm wrong? Just look at the disorder that comes from political debates. If we were to apply godly wisdom to the government, it would be more that they would come together as a whole and both sides would seek to do what was best for the country. But thank God our hope is not in the government. If you want to speak truth into someone's life, seek to do so peaceably. Next, we see that wisdom from above is gentle and accommodating. The ESV says it's open to reason. If we are displaying godly wisdom, we know what we know, but our knowledge is not the final word. We should be gentle and loving when sharing the truth from the wisdom of God. This truth is, worded, is rooted in the phrase, it is by grace you have been saved. Church, we cannot forget that. It is by grace that we have been saved. Far too often we get wrapped up in everything and grace is the last thing that we're showing people. Show me your wisdom, not by claiming you know it all. Many times in my life when I have tried to assume someone else's circumstances, I have been humbled to find out that I would most likely have the same outlook if I had to walk a mile in their shoes. Now God's truth is immovable and his word is final. Standing on his word is not open for debate. But when it comes to my opinion and my own ideas, I need to be accommodating and not trying to bend others to my outlook. The more I try to interject my opinion, the more I move away from the wisdom of God and into earthly wisdom. Also, we see that godly wisdom is full of mercy. If grace is getting what you don't deserve, mercy is not getting what you do. If grace is getting what you don't deserve, mercy is not getting what you do. Is our wisdom full of mercy, or do we try to tear people down with what we know to be true? Wisdom from above is full of mercy, seeking not to give people what they deserve, rather to save them from what they do, by leading them in love towards the grace of Jesus Christ. Wisdom from God is full of good fruit. If you are wise, you are producing good fruit. Show me someone who is bearing fruit, and I will show you a wise person. To be pure, gentle, peaceable, accommodating, full of mercy, means to be bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Wisdom from God is impartial. It doesn't play favorites. All people need the love of God, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And lastly, when the wisdom of, from above is, and lastly, the wisdom from above is not hypocritical. So JBF, there's a lot here to think about this morning. But I would challenge you this week to pick up your Bibles and read through the book of James, to ask God to show you where earthly wisdom has settled into your life, and go out and be wise in Him. There are a lot of flags to run behind. There are a lot of causes to carry. But are they rooted in godly wisdom? That's the question. Is it rooted in godly wisdom? Well, I have one more little illustration. Um, it just happens to be some photos of my lovely daughter from a year or so ago. And you can go ahead and show the first picture. I just want you to see that, that, that gaze right there. She's just looking off into space, just happy, not a care in the world. And I don't know if you can tell, but she's got a, a dandelion that has died and the seeds are starting to sprout in her hand. Um, go ahead in the next 
slide. And um, in her earthly wisdom, she decided to go ahead and, and take a bite. And uh, um, kind of like her father up here drinking some nastiness, I'm gonna shake it up some. This is her response. Oh, yeah, dig it in. Oh, there we go. <laughs> this morning, JBF, may we be disgusted by earthly wisdom. May it not have any root or any bearing in, in our lives. And, and if it does, then may we fall on our knees and ask God how we can remove these things from our, our, our lives. Because it's not always going to look like this. There's been a lot of people that have been deceived and they've blended the world's truth along with God's truth and it's become this hybrid gospel. We war against it by living out our faith. We war against it by living out godly wisdom. We fight this battle through God's power, and God says, as far as it be within your strength, be at peace. Well, we're going to close in, in a closing song here. I was just thrilled at this service. I hope that you see that here at JBF, things are moving. If you're not a part of the train, jump on. Continue to pray that Jessa Bible Fellowship is a beacon of light that points people to Christ alone. And when we spread out and we go our separate ways, my prayer is that you live out godly wisdom. Lean on each other. Lean in. There's no lone wolves here. As you can see in the youth ministry and in the ministries that go on, it takes a lot of people. If we join together for the cause of Christ, what type of impact could we have? It's not just Jessup. It's not just Iowa. Not just the United States. But we could have a worldly impact because we're seeking to honor our God and not ourselves. Let me pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to come speak your word, to sit in and just to see uh, just how things have been going within the youth ministry, all the way from the little kids up to the high schoolers. Lord, I pray even now for those that are about to graduate, Lord, I pray that they would not be ensnared by this worldly wisdom, but that they would seek out godly wisdom as well. Thank you for the hearts of those that have volunteered. Thank you for those volunteers out there that haven't volunteered yet. Lord, and just pray that we would continue to seek to honor you with our lives. And Lord, that we would do it as your, your congregation, your, your body of believers here in Jessup. Thank you again for this day. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.